Wrong program. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Your Author program. My name is Patty Valdovinos, librarian in the Multilingual Collections Department. And I am here today with my colleague, Celia Avila de Santiago, senior librarian at the, at the Junupero Serra branch of the Los Angeles Public Library. It is our pleasure to host the Your Author series today. Please feel free to use the chat box to communicate your thoughts, comments, and questions throughout the program. And also, don't forget to email ecdept at lapl.org here on the screen to be entered into an opportunity drawing to win a copy of today's book, Summer in the City of Roses, uh, by Michelle Ruiz Kyle. In today's Your Author program, Michelle Ruiz Kyle will present her latest novel, Summer in the City of Roses, Michelle's work has received praise from the New York Times, Entertainment Weekly, NBC News, Kirkus Reviews, and other high profile publications. She is the 2020 Literary Lions honoree and a recipient of the 2020 Hedgebrook Residency. Michelle currently lives in Portland with her family in a cottage on the border of the forest and the city. We wanna thank our generous donors, the Lenora S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund and the Library Foundation for helping the library bring these amazing author and illustrator programs to you. Thank you all so very much. Uh, and we are super grateful for that. And now for the moment we have all been waiting for, I personally have been waiting all day, dying for this moment. All day. So <laughs> welcome Michelle. Hi, thank Yay. you so much. It's so nice to be here. We're very excited to have you here with us. Um, all right, so let's get started with some Q&A. Celia, are you ready? Michelle, are you ready? I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready. This Friday, the third, we just realized it was Friday the 13th too. Oh, I just realized it was Friday. I'm a mess today because it's Friday the 13th. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Michelle, for taking the time to be here with us today. It's wonderful to, ha it's wonderful to have you here and while we talk to you about your creative process, your book, The Simmer in the City of Roses, and to learn more about you. Uh, can you start us off by sharing your favorite passage? Sure. Um, I will start you off um, with this section called, let me get my light going. <laughs> um, this is the beginning of chapter two, Sensing the Hunter's Footstep. Or sees stars, thinks about the phrase, he saw stars, words for a cartoon head injury, a cast iron pan to the head, he gags, a sudden rancidness, the scent of an unwashed pan, the way the kitchen smells when dad's away and mom leaves the dishes in the sink all week. But this isn't kitchen grease or a dream. It's the smell of the men pulling him from his bed. Um, I chose that because that was actually the first sentence that came to me um, for this book. That was the how the whole thing started was sort of that voice and that sentence. Oh, that's so interesting to hear. Um, so, okay, we'll come back to that in a second, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that with us. Right. Um, so uh, to get started on our questions, and remember everyone, you can add your questions in the chat box and we'll work them in as we can. Uh, so Michelle, what was the publishing process for Summer in the City of Roses like? Mm -hmm. And um, for the cover art, Patty and I both thought that the cover art was really beautiful. We really enjoyed all of the different designs. Uh, so we we're wondering, you know, if there's multiple artists or versions that you get to see and how that comes to be, like how much say the author gets. Well, let's see, the publishing process was really different than my first book because um, I was I sold Summer in the City of Roses on proposal to my publisher, which means if uh, you've already sold a book, you can sometimes sell a book without actually finishing or writing the whole book, uh, which is not the case with the first novel at all. You have to have a complete, almost perfect novel to get out there and sell. So um, I wrote a little synopsis and some sample pages, and my editor was excited about the idea and said, okay, great, let's do this. So then suddenly you have a deadline where before I had many, many, many open-ended years, many, many open-ended years for my first book, I had about a year and a half total to get this together um, and make it into a book. So that was a really different process. Um, luckily, there were moments where I wasn't so sure it was gonna work, but in the end, it came. everything came through. Sort of last minute, I finished the book, I found what I wanted to find and um, you know, gave it to my editor. And it really wasn't until um, I got to, I got to read the audiobook for this book, and I didn't for my first book. But when I actually read the audiobook, I realized that I had achieved what I wanted, what I set out to achieve with this book, and I felt very satisfied because, in a way, it was so fast that I, I was a little scared to let it out in the world because mm -hmm. it had been such a quick process compared to the ten years that I sat with the story with my first book. 
so that was sort of the publishing process. Um, it was it was um, it was pretty wonderful to know that I had taught myself how to write a book. I think so. You know, I could actually do that in a little bit more of a compressed time period, and yet still have a complete book at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and as for the cover, I just that was just that was pure luck. Um, there is a cover artist. Um, we had a few cover artists that we, we had hoped to work with, and all of them fell through. And we found this artist who. Uh, was unknown to the publisher. The publisher does all of that. They find an artist. Um, they do show me the artist's work to see if I like it. And I'm very lucky to have a publisher who gives me a lot of input about the art of my book. I um, provided a few sample photographs for, they knew they wanted a picture of the brother in the book. Mm -hmm. or, um, and so I sent them some ideas of what I thought he might look like. And the, uh, you know, the, the artist reads the book and managed to kind of weave elements from the book into the art. And so the painting is, is all one artist um, who is uh, um, Maga Gon on Instagram, M-A-G-A dot G-O-N. If you want to look at her work, it's so beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. And um, then an artist at Soho who is a cover designer um, puts together the, the font and the print and it was amazing because I wasn't sure. It, it, to me, at first, it missed that sort of punk rock element that the book also has. Yeah. But with the black, they, you know, with the addition of the black T-shirt and sort of the way that they did the print, which is sort of like a zine or a poster, I feel like they managed to combine the elements in a really amazing way. So I got, I felt like I lucked out so much, um, loving really both the book covers for both of my books. Yeah, I thought it really did a good job at showcasing, like, especially after reading. And I was like, oh, my God, it's like perfect. It's like right spot on. Um, before Patty asked her next question, I wanted to ask about the audiobook. You said you read you read the audiobook for it. How it would what's that process like and how does that compare? Like, do you have to are you alone? Do you get feedback on <laughs> like maybe because I, I did listen to portions of it in the car also. So like I know you're singing and stuff. So how did you prepare for the oh, singing portions and <gasps> and that feedback <laughs> editing process? And do you prefer the writing process or the like audio process more? Oh, it's so funny. Um, the singing part. So I conveniently so I, I lobbied to read my first book. I, I have an mm -hmm. acting background. So I'm like, I can do this. You know, I'm a trained actor. I can read my book. But oftentimes, um, oftentimes an author thinks they want to read their book and then they kind of realize that they're not, that the process is more involved. And often it's difficult to sort of get that request met. Um, but with the second book, I made a demo. Um, I had done a little bit of voice work recently. So I, I made an actual demo and I just really auditioned with my own book and was super happy to find out that I had gotten it and was you know happily in the recording studio reading the book and it's really just me you and an engineer so it's i felt very collaborative our work together and then i looked at the bottom of the page and i was like i put singing in here <laughs> no and then i'm like wait stop i'm like okay so if i could say the singing because i've heard that done in audiobooks people yeah. think, like that's not right that's not how it's <laughs> in my head I have to sing it. And he was like, well, do you not sing? And I'm like, I am a shy singer though. I, mm -hmm. I sing to my children and my pets. Okay, so I sing at home. I don't sing out in the world. But then I realized that the that the singing is really the memory of a lullaby that their mother sings mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. And it is, um, so really it only has to be as good as a mom sings to her kid. And I'm like, well, I do that. I can. I did that, I can do it. So he just was really gentle and patient with me and um, we went very slowly. And luckily my recording engineer is someone who actually has perfect pitch. So he could tell if I was on and I, so I trusted him to tell me if, you know, if it wasn't right. So we, you know, we did it a few times for each little singing bit and um, he was really supportive and kind. And I felt um, really empowered actually for doing it because I let it be what it was and not be perfect, which, you know, I'm, I'm a Virgo that doesn't always come <laughs> totally naturally to me, but I loved reading it. I loved it. My, my writing process is super auditory. I read every line I write mm -hmm. out loud multiple times. I can't edit quiet. So I can't coffee shop edit cause I'm that lady talking to herself. You know? <laughs> I have to, I have to do some more where I can. And mm -hmm. I actually read the words like, um, as if they were being acted or mm -hmm as if I was sort of saying the dialogue of a movie I'm seeing, it's all super auditory for me. So it was natural to read it for me. 
Um, and it felt good because I had a very specific idea of how I wanted it to sound. Yeah, and it was, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go, go. It was cool to, to know that you were, you know, reading it as well. So that that does add a little extra something, so. Yeah. And I think I think it makes it more authentic. I think you mentioned with the, the mom's lullaby, right? So when we read a lot of these books relating to our Latinidad and our Latinx culture, I think you, you do picture your mom or your grandmother singing it. So I think it was very beautiful that that experience, that's an experience you get to share with the readers or the listeners for your audiobook. Um, I did have a question about your uh, cover though, going back to that. Did, was there anything when she gave you the first draft that you wanted the artist to include or was it just a one get go? Like here's the artwork and then that was it or? No, there's a lot of iterations. So she gave back several sketches and I think okay. that the publisher doesn't show you that, show you a sketch until it's close because they don't want you to freak out <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they don't. <laughs> but they, they showed it to me at a certain point and it was a certain okay. amount of done and I had a little bit of input about um, some of the things but honestly it was pretty spot on pretty mm -hmm. quickly um, with my first book there was an issue of just getting the girl's expression on the cover just right but I feel like yeah. for him she really had his expression right yeah. um, and then it was a matter of um, getting the colors right because there's a certain there's a certain green, there's a certain red, there's a certain just sort of Pacific Northwest. You know, yeah. like when you're in California, you immediately see the, the palette of the flowers is just slightly different than when you go the farther north you mm -hmm. go. So she didn't know that naturally. Um, you know, she mm -hmm. was she was doing her art, you know, in Chile. So she didn't she didn't know. So it took a while to sort of get that dialed in. But um yeah, so so there were different versions and then there was a there were several different versions of the background color. Oh. I have actually a really cool PDF with like lots of different possibilities <laughs> in the background. There was like a golden yellow that was really pretty that I liked, but ultimately, and they re the, the publisher really wanted this almost like dove gray kind of pale. And at first I was really like, I don't know, is that black? Is it washed out? But after a while, I just sat with all of them and I was like, no, they're right. I like this much more. It, 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 yeah. it showcases the art, the other bright colors almost. I felt like you know over overpowered the art a little bit because it's very delicate some of it. Yeah, and and it's great. I think um, it really does. When you mentioned the colors, you really do see Portland, and I think that was it. It makes it part of the book, and it it's just as important as the text in the book. So thank you for sharing that. All right, question. Next question. Uh, there are some heavy topics that come up, like sex work and body positivity, in your book. What was the research process to, um, like to tackle these topics? Well, um, in terms of sex work activism, that was part of what I was trying to think about, the things that I loved about Portland when I first moved to Portland in the early 90s. And I moved there as um, pregnant with my first daughter as a young mom, and also um, had some experience in activism from, from earlier in my life, and found an amazing group of activists that sort of inspired the activists in uh, Summer in the City of Roses. There was an organization here in Portland called Danzine that did street-based needle exchange programs that had a thrift store that did a that had a zine for sex workers that was amazing. Um, started by Teresa Dulce, mm -hmm. who is also uh, known as Joanna Burton Martinez, who's also still an activist in um, the harm reduction community. And I was just um, I was so inspired by that that at that time it really kept me connected with things that mattered to me, sort of outside my little world of you know my baby and my family, mm -hmm. kept me connected with um, something amazing about Portland, which is that there was a lot of DIY activism. This person saw a need for um, these services and didn't see anyone else providing them. Knew that the people that she was serving would trust her because she was part of their community, and just simply made it happen just made it happen so um that was so the research there was sort of just getting going back into my memories of what that was like looking back into old journals i have some copies of that zine which is very rare now and i found those tucked away um talking to uh, joanna as well about that time and um and doing a little bit of just online research looking at the media that talked about um the sex work organizing mm -hmm. that was happening and the street level outreach that was happening at that time and then in terms of body positivity, you know, that's something that I have been working on my whole life and something that as a mom, I really tried to um, practice and in my household. And as always, you know, in the face of 
so many other messages in the media and in the world. And I'm the mom of two daughters. So, you know, that that research, I think, is just, I didn't really need to research much. It was just like, that's daily life. That's the struggle. And I wanted to think, I was sort of trying to write about a family that was a little bit like, like our family, which I, I hadn't seen quite in anything that I had read. And so that was something, you know, body positivity and feminism that's been sort of baked into the into the family from the beginning, um, you know, from both my partner and myself. And I wanted to explore what that would be like on the page. That's incredible. And I think, you know, body positivity is something, I grew up in a household of only women. So it's something that you'd like continuously struggle with. And, it, and you include it in your book and you include it in authentically, right? With the struggles of it happening where you have the character being like, struggling with that, right? So you see that that uh, character development in that sense and the other characters influencing her in that way. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned, this might go a little bit along it. So um, do you hide any like secrets in your book that only a few people will find? I know you mentioned some of your, your personal experiences and friends kind of tied into it. So, and if so, you know, and some of the things that you put into your books that mimic life, do your friends ever like comment about it or like give you feedback or? Yes, that? I mean, there's, there's a few people that from way back in the day that read it that are like, I knew who that character Glow is. I, I <laughs> was a tiny dancer that was the phone is rack. And I was like, yes, these are the old school Portland people. So there's some of that. Um, I also got a lot of support from people on Facebook that are of a certain age that grew, grew up uh, in that early 90s time and that are a little younger than I am or that just didn't, you know, have kids when I, I moved to Portland. I never really got to go out, out in Portland. I had, I had babies and you know, no babysitter and we were just, yeah. So I, I didn't know much about that part of 90s Portland. So I had to rely on all of the people that I know. Mm -hmm. And so there are a few little Easter eggs in there. There's um, an author, Renee Denfeld, who is a Portland author. I really love and admire amazing literary citizen as well as a great writer and i did not know until she shared on facebook that she had been in a punk band called caustic soda back in the day so i <laughs> i definitely included that in there just as a little easter egg for anyone who knew and for for her just as a thank you because she mm. helped me so much with like the flavor of what those clubs were like and what that scene was like mm -hmm. there's also a wee teeny weeny crossover from my first book in this book that um, only people who really are watching for it might notice. Mm. So I, I put that, I popped that in there as well. Um, just, I was surprised to find it actually. I was like, oh, who are these musicians? Oh, I know who these musicians are. As I, as I described them physically, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I know you people from my other book. So, so there's some of that. And then of course, for my family, I'm always getting in trouble because they're like, that was the best joke and you used it. So I think a line where um, where If says that um, Mount Hood is conceited because it just thinks it looks so great. You know, I, I, that's, that's my younger daughters. I will just um, say that belongs to her. She's always just, I'm like, look how beautiful the mountain is. She's like, yeah, it knows it. It's showing off. <laughs> Come on. But you know, she has a point just so like perfect and like mm -hmm. snow-capped and I don't know. So anyway, yeah, I just steal from my family liberally and I, I have no <laughs> I have no questions about that whatsoever. <laughs> uh, my partner says that writing is not an honorable uh, uh, you know, um occupation and you know I mean, <laughs> yeah, if they're gonna say funny stuff, I'm gonna use it. Yeah, might as well. I'm gonna think of that every time I see the mountains like in the background <laughs> yeah. and they look beautiful i'm gonna think about your daughter and being like yeah. they know it yeah they they know it i mean the audacity of nature y'all like that's i i just i mean leave it to teens and like children you know to come up with these things it's amazing yeah. Yeah. i think they're they're wonderful reminders of how sometimes we just forget to take things in and when things like that are said you're like oh my god that is true and yeah, it works that. perfectly but that was totally one of my favorite lines from the book. So. Yeah, I kind of love that just too because I think that, um, you know, it, it kind of speaks, just as we're talking right now, I'm realizing it kind of speaks to the magic realism mm -hmm. that's just like, you know, in the first part of the book that's kind of very lightly in there, yeah. but it's really kind of about a worldview where everything is sort of alive and potentially like, you know, has an attitude no. or whatever. So I, I kind of loved it for that reason too, I think. That's cool. All right. Uh, so this one's kind of similar to the previous question, but um, 
I'm just gonna go. We're just gonna go ahead and ask it. So, um, are there characters? Are are the characters based on real life people? Um, and who are they? And then, can you tell us about the character development of if and or and their parents? Yes. So, I started off. I started off with an idea for um, a story about generational trauma because I was thinking about this that you know as parents who've had a really challenging time um, in their youth or childhood, we often go the like way extra mile and like overprotect because we're like oh no not my kid my kid's gonna have it way better than me. Yeah. But even when that happens, I think that some of our I mean it's just some of our unresolved trauma or even some of our resolved stuff it, it seeps in and i think that now they're finding that even some of that is like you know passed genetically so i wanted to look at a really super close family and i wanted to see what happened when um when some when, when that change comes where the family has to has to change the dynamic has to change and i wanted to see how when the kids were out on their own how and if that generational trauma would affect them um, and sort of um, really uh, shape the choices that they made and the things that they encountered in their lives. And so that was my original thought. And I also wanted to write about um, neurodifference in a way that felt authentic to the way it's experienced in my family. And I wanted to really talk about um, what it was like to raise a family here in Portland and to find a way, I think, maybe even to connect with this land. Because I think before I wrote this book, I, I still felt only rooted in California. That's, you know, where I grew up in the Bay Area. And I didn't feel the same kind of connectedness to place here that I did there. And I, I wanted to, but then I thought, I've lived here for over 25 years. My whole family has been shaped and raised here. So I wanted to learn more about what I love about the place and what I love about the land and what I know about it. So, so all of those things, um, so, so, the, so the land is a real character. The places are very real. The neighborhood where um, tourist trucking is, which is, you know, a place that uh, if ends up spending a lot of time in Southeast Portland is my old neighborhood in Southeast Portland where my kids were raised. Um, all of the, I wanted that character is, place is always character in, in my work. And so I wanted that character to be very real. And then even though the parents and the kids in the book are slightly started out based-ish on my family, they, they, they took on lives of their own so quickly. And um, people, you know, friends who've read it or whatever, so they really expected the people to be actually more like our family and found that they were totally other people. So I really, I, I like how that, that happened, how the characters um, took on their own lives. And then I really, the other trick I wanted to do was um, I, 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 it's a pet peeve of mine in YA where the parents are just sort of not there or, you know, or they're a big part of the kid's lives, but they're not really talked about or something. And so they're kind of conveniently blurred out the way babies often are in like sitcoms, you know, where the baby is never there. So I just thought, <laughs> how can I, how can I put the parents there, but, but still have it be grounded with the kids? And I thought, when a really close family, everything is sort of filtered through the family, especially when most of the time, you know, in teenage kids, uh, they branch out and they break off, but when they don't, or when they do and it's unsuccessful, they often go way back in, even closer. And that was something I experienced. And I wanted to be like, all right, so everything starts to be filtered through this little unit mm -hmm. um, that forms with a close family with like teenage kids and parents where they start to share interests and movies and music and all of yeah. these things in a way almost that you, that other kids might with their peers. And then I wanted to sort of break that apart and see what would happen and show almost like who the parents were through how the kids saw them. And then also hoping that some readers would also realize that the kids' perception of their parents is not always um, 100% accurate, right? Because we don't totally see our parents as they are. And then, um, and then I hoped that, you know, eventually at the end, everybody could have some character development and everybody could change and transform, you know, as you do when any one person in the family has a major change, it, it ripples out to everyone. And I wanted everyone to get that chance to also have some, some growth and also to show that the, that generational trauma sometimes does get picked up by our kids 
and then transformed in really beautiful ways that we could never ever have um, anticipated. That is, that, that is beautifully said. I, I, you see it a lot, I think, when their parents weren't there, but a lot of their choices were, I think, were based on experiences of their parents or like siblings, right? And so even, and I, I think about that when you were talking about how even it plays out, and I think my family, right? My I don't live at home, I live alone, but sometimes when I am in situations, I do include the family. And, and it, I think that was a beautiful like reflection that I just had. And, Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is great. I can listen to this all day. Give me all the cheese, man. Um, <laughs> but uh, so one of the things that I really liked about, um, you know, at the beginning when if and or are talking about like the games that they play, I thought was really interesting. And I liked um, I liked their, you know, their three favorite darknesses and what um, ice cream people, ice cream people as ice cream flavors. Mm -hmm. So Patty and I were wondering if you, you know, just out of curiosity, like what your three favorite darknesses are. And, um, you know, if you were an ice cream flavor, what would you be? I was, okay. Well, okay, my three favorite darknesses currently are um, my daughter's baby Aussie Doodle Pandora, who is all blacky black and just like mm -hmm. curly um, and who is adorable. So, <laughs> and her, her little nose is even, even blacker than her curls and I just absolutely love it. Um, I'm, uh, you know, black eyeliner is still a very favorite black. I have, I have some really nice liquid eyeliner yeah. right now that I'm, I'm kind of terrible at using, but I'm working on it. It's one of my pandemic goals is to get, <laughs> to get the liquid eyeliner cat eyes, but it's hard. It's so, so hard. <laughs> that one I love. And then um, I would say, um, yeah, for the last one, what would it be? Oh, I guess there are these beautiful peppers that you can get sometimes in the summer at the farmer's market that are almost, they're black. I mean, they're like, mm -hmm. almost are purple, but they're so dark, they're almost black. And I would say okay. that one, I can't, that's a little bit of a fetch, but I will, I will count it. It's your name. I will take it. <laughs> I, I wish I knew what those peppers were called, but they have a great name. I'm going to have to. Are they them. little? Or no, are they they're like, like they're like medium. They're medium. Um, and they're not like round like a bell pepper. They're like a little bit elongated, but they're like. You know, are they dry? No, no, they're um, oh. they're they're fresh. They're fresh. Oh, I feel they're like we're playing fresh. charades now. Yeah. Like, what is? That? <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, I'm not sure though what they're called, but um, oh. almost like it's, excuse me, almost like an eggplant color. But um, oh, okay, if I was an ice cream flavor. I would probably be. This is so funny. I'm just thinking this right now. Um, the Jamocha almond fudge flavor that they used to have at Baskin Robbins. Oh my that God. one is delicious. That is a delicious mm -hmm. flavor. Yes, I think that would be me. Although I also really love the coconut pineapple, but I think that mm -hmm. I, I'm, I like to, I like that, but I don't think I am that. I think I am the other. I need to go to Baskin Robbins more. I, I know. I right? want ice cream now. <laughs> Do, do they well, welcome to our ice cream chat, everybody. Oh, I mean, do they still have the dollar scoop? Didn't they have one? We used to go all the time when we were younger. No. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that was like my Nana and I. My Nana was so great because she would be like, we'd be like asleep in bed, like in our pajamas, like honestly, <laughs> like watching TV, watching Quincy on TV. I don't know. You probably are both all too young for that. But it was like a, he was like a medical examiner. Anyway, it was like late night TV. We'd be watching and I'd be kind of dozing and then she'd be like, are you hungry? I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm kind of hungry. And she'd be like, Baskin Robbins is open for 20 more minutes. And so we'd like, we'd like, you know, throw in our clothes, like we'd be in our jammies, but we'd get redressed, go to Baskin Robbins, come back, get back in bed with, <laughs> with our ice cream. So, yeah. Those are rich. I call those rituals because they're just amazing. I mean, I'm surprised you even changed. I would have just gone in my PJs. I Same. Know, I know. I was, well, yeah. Nana was like, I'm not going in my PJs, but. <laughs> Nana's like, no, no. I have uh, memories <laughs> of like collecting like quarters and change just to get that Baskin Robin like scoop. Yes. And so yes. those are, um, those are nice. And I'm a huge ice cream person. So, yeah. all right. Uh, okay. So you're someone's gonna have to help me with this uh, this uh, name. Why if it did? How do you say this? The what if's name is based off of Iphigenia. Yes. Iphigenia and the Grim Fairy. See, we always need help. Why Iphigenia and the Grim Fairy Tale, brother and sister? What was it about these two tales that inspired you to write Summer in the City of Roses? Okay. Well, I I have been thinking about both stories for a long time. Um, the Iphigenia and Orestes story, 
I had been thinking about for a really long time. There's some really interesting parts of that. I was when I, I used to be a theater person, and I it was something I'd always kind of wanted to um, to produce. There's um, a couple. There are a couple of, of Greek tragedies with her story featuring, and then. Um, and then I was thinking about, you know, little brother and little sister just really fascinated me. You know, it's a story where they get lost in the forest. It's kind of a Hansel and gretel thing where they have the mean stepmother. They leave because they're being terribly mistreated and they go into the forest. And every time they stop at a stream, the little sister can hear the stream whispering, you know, whoever drinks from me will become a tiger and then, or whoever drinks from me will become a wolf. And then the final stream, of course, says whoever will drinks from me will become a roebuck, you know, which is like a certain kind of a European deer, I guess. And so finally the brother drinks and he does get turned into a deer. And then the story goes on to be quite bizarre as, you know, the non disney Grimm stories really <laughs> totally are. And I got, I, I don't know what it was about that, but like it was the loyalty, I think, between mm. the siblings. And that's one really in thing that interests me as an only child because mm. I always wanted a sibling. And one of the nice things that happened in my life to me is I had two daughters that are like best friends. Their bond together is so beautiful to me. And I kept thinking about wanting to see that on the page, to see that bond. And um, and then I realized as the, these two things were kind of going around in my head. And actually, I was going to apply for um, a residency and they wanted to know what I was going to work on. And I had no idea. So I just wrote it down that I would I was going to combine these stories and write a, and write a story about generational trauma. And then, and this happens to me a lot where I will apply for something and then I'll realize, oh yeah, I'm actually going to write that though. And so this is what happened. I, I thought, oh, that's what they have in common. They're really about healing from trauma. You know, the, the kids in little brother and little sister, their mother has died. They're in the care of like a not very nice person. Mm -hmm. And they've got all of this that they're dealing with. And of course, Iphigenia and Orestes are have one of the most tragic families in all of Greek mythology so i wanted to play with that and then there were just some fun details as i got going you know with uh, the furies in, in in the stories and in, in the greek tragedy orestes is pursued by the furies and so i thought well that's like the perfect the perfect riot girl band and once i got that i was like okay this is this is gonna work that's so cool go ahead Cindy. To follow up on that, um, so when you you had decided to do, you know, have it based on those those two stories, but and then so I'm trying to like gather the question in my head. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, um, what came first, that passage that you read to us earlier, or did that come before or after you had already decided to to base it on the two stories? So, like, did you develop it after having that like first aha moment? I guess. Um, you know, I, I did. So I, I, I had that moment and I wrote kind of a synopsis for it. Then I thought, what would that look like? And, um, and I thought, okay, well, um, the father does, does a betrayal. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the Greek story of Iphigenia, her father betrays her. And I thought, what could the betrayal be in this situation? And I thought the betrayal will be a lie. And I thought, what is the worst betrayal that, that could be done to this to this girl? And I thought, something to do with her brother. And so I just started to write, and I was writing from his point of view. His voice came much more easily to me. Mm -hmm. And um, just four saw stars was the first thing I thought of. And then I realized what was going to happen to him, what was happening to him. Um, as I wrote into it, I didn't know that. But... Um, I remember once when our daughter was younger and having a really difficult time, um, someone had suggested um, a camp like that to us. And we, of course, were like, why? We, that wasn't our style. That wasn't something we wanted to do. I know that there's some kids that has been helpful or and some programs are better than the one I'm talking about. But back in the 90s, this was pretty new and it was not as regulated as now. And so I thought that would be that kind of a situation would be like the worst betrayal. Um, and so that sort of set it in motion. And, you know, starting with the Greek tragedy and honestly with this really intense grim fairy tale, because um, it gets really weird. I, I, thought, <laughs> I was like, OK, this, this, is, this is tragic. This will do. Wow. Wait, forgive my ignorance. There's really like I, I'm just going to call them boot camp. That's because I went to boot camp yesterday. But they have like camps like that, like actual camp. 
Yes, yes, they do. And and some programs actually, you know, I've done a lot of research, actually. I wanted to be clear about what I was talking about when I mm -hmm. talked about this kind of program. And so they're, they're, they're like wilderness, like kind of like outward bound experiences that I think uh, are meant okay. to be, right? Where they're in they're a wilderness camp, they're meant to foster resilience, independence, you know, teamwork, all of that stuff. Oh, okay. And I think that, um, and then I think in some cases and some programs and for some kids, that can be so super positive. Mm -hmm. However, um, I think that especially in the 90s, people don't realize how much more of an understanding we have about um, neurodifferences and neurodivergence now mm -hmm. than we did then. Um, we really didn't have as much then. And some of the yeah. things that we know now are sensory issues, um, for instance, were just seen as like behavior problems. Yeah. You know, so I think that um, I think that that was sort of the spirit with which some of those um, programs treated kids like war. Okay. Now, now I understand it because I was. Uh, but I think the kidnapping part is what threw me off because I've oh, never. No, that, that happens. That still happens. That's okay. See, I've, I that was where I was like, wait a minute, because yes. yeah. Yes. Yes. Wow. That still happens, and you know that was a chilling experience I had where someone suggested um, that. You know, that was within our power to do with our teenager. And we were like, that's something we will never <laughs> choose. I'm out of here. You know, that was creepy to me. But it is something that happens. Um, parents do have those rights over their kids. And that is something that happens. And it's really spoken of in a very sanitized way, like a transport team. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, that's, that's what it's called. Yeah, wow. like when, when they were in the room looking at the brochures of all the different ones, I was just like, this is sounds terrible. Um, you know, I, yeah. I, well, I was just going to, because you talk about generational trauma, right? And talk about generational, because in the dad's eye, right? He was like, you're sad and in your room, this is the best way that I'm going to help you, right? Yes. And then, so it, like you could see how his own trauma has played out into the, like, the projection of right of his own insecurities onto his child yes, and then you yes. and so you like I, I, you did that very beautifully after you know seeing it and then but just the choices of parents have consequences even if it's the best they think that it, they think it's the best yes. for the children yeah, yes and we can all yes and we can all make mistakes and a lot of the worst mistakes we make in hindsight we can see as parents are because of our own fears mm -hmm. yeah yeah I um I have one more follow up question. Sorry, I, I thought it was it was interesting. You mentioned you you know writing from Or's point of view was came more naturally to you when you wrote from If's point of view. Were there any certain things that you found a little bit more difficult to write about as her, or anything you did to kind of get into the If mindset, like mindset, and be like, I am not Or, I am If. <laughs> She did this. <laughs> this is the probe. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, it was really hard. I could not find her voice. Mm -hmm. I knew that she was this combination of like very intelligent and, and intuitive, so wise in that way, and yet also such a teenager because she's someone who has been protected and allowed to be you know, a youth, like that's mm -hmm. a good, so, so from my perspective, that's a good thing. Like I wanted my kids to be kids at 17, yes. to get to be, if that's what they wanted to be and what they were, that's what they should get to be, you know, not to have to be adult, you know, adults early on, because that was my experience. So mm -hmm. when I was getting, so it was hard for me to remember what it was like to be if, but I thought, so, so thinking about 17 didn't work for me at all, but thinking about 15, that's when oh. I finally figured her out because 15 was more like that for me. And also when I realized that she was a theater person the way that I was a theater person. And I started looking at my theater books and I have this, you know, collection of um, Stanislavski acting manuals that are old, beautiful, hardbound books. <laughs> um, one of which I will... I shouldn't confess this to you guys because you're librarians, but it was something that I never turned back into a library. And I we all have one of those books. <laughs> okay, yeah, I have some of those. It's off my, it's off my chest. I'm sorry. Um, um, I'm sorry um, to the community college, uh, Lake Chabot Community College. I, I apologize. It's been like 30 years, but I've taken very good care of this book. And in my slight defense, no one had checked it out for like 10 years before See? I so, you did them a favor. They didn't have to weed it. It's fine. Okay. It's yeah, fine. you're fine. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I found the other ones to go with it. But anyway, once I went back to 
reading that book, I remembered what it was like to read that book for the first time. And that was the first thing I ever saw that talked about how you become an artist. Like, not just like someone discovers you and you become famous, but like how you learn to do the work of an artist and to think like an artist. Mm-hmm. And that was humongous for me. It changed everything for me. And um, and that helped me find if. Once I started rereading Stanislavski, it was like, boom, she was right there. That's so fascinating. I would have thought that you would have said Shakespeare since like yeah. so many of her interactions with George and some of the yeah. like, involved. I, so yeah, that came out. She takes her came after definitely. But then I realized such a theater nerd like she loves Shakespeare. So yeah, yeah, that's so that's so fascinating. Thank you. I get so invoked, and then I'm like, wait, wait, wait. wait. Uh, yes. So um, uh, so. Coming back to If, she finds herself in many people's like shoes and clothing throughout the novel. It seemed like If's character developed through the scenes where she's putting on everybody else's wardrobes. Um, is it something that you planned or are we maybe thinking too much <laughs> into the clothing? Oh my gosh, I love this question the most of everything because um, at first I didn't plan it, but then later I did. So this happens to me a lot where I'll just write away and I'll just try to solve each problem as it comes up. And like, okay, she's there, her dress is ruined. It's all crunchy and gross because it's a dry clean only dress that got rained on and she, she can't go around wearing that. So what is she going to wear? And she's not going to fit into anything of George's. And then I realized they're at Nana's house, George's Nana's house, George's Nana has clothes. And I just decided that George's Nana and if were the same size. And there's a lot of cool vintage clothes in that closet that if can read. So immediately she's changed her wardrobe has changed and then i also realized that i can't have her going around without glasses the entire time because she, i just like <laughs> i i am as nearsighted as that that is one thing i do share with if is that near, and i'm like that would not work so i had to get her some find some way to get her some glasses so mm-hmm. those were just practical plot things that i had written myself into that i had to get out of but then also there's this um there's this book called the virgin's promise which is a writing manual. It's mostly geared to, to screenwriting, but I think it's great for novelists as well. And it is an alternative to the hero's journey story structure. So I, I, I need a lot, I have to work hard at plot. And so this is why I like these sort of mythic structure um, manuals because they help me with plot. And The Virgin's Promise is especially cool because it talks about more of a fairy tale plot and or more of like a more of like a smaller story, not like a big mythic, this is gonna change the world, but this is gonna change someone's life and someone's family or community. And one of the one of the sort of story steps, you know, in the hero's journey, it's like the call to adventure, the refusal of the call, the meeting with the mentor. Well, one of the steps in the Virgin's Promise is dressing the part. And this is my favorite part. And if you look at her analysis of movies, like Legally Blonde, for instance, you know, or that's that's the one she uses a lot. That is a virgin's promise. And dressing the part is amazing. It's like she dresses the part of mm-hmm. sort of one when she goes to law school and then really dresses the part as a lawyer. She has, there is a wardrobe change that's commensurate. And then at the end, a big wardrobe change. Mm-hmm. So I think that, um, I think about that a lot because I love that moment. I think it's something that, um, it's like a beautiful moment that maybe gets downplayed in importance, but I think it's super important. So yes, when I finally realized, I realized that something needed to happen for if to have a transformation. And then I realized that, that Velma would give her a dress mm-hmm. and, and thanks for how kind she was and that she would get kind of a reward for that and that it would be a dress and the dress would actually magically fit. And it would be a perfect dress to go out and recite Shakespeare in. And it would be, you know, if really getting to be a leading lady finally, which I really wanted for her. And it really felt in that moment that she was like in charge, right? Like in command of herself and like in that leading role. So, yeah. And and the boots and the shoes um, also kind of did that. I felt like the boots and the shoes were sort of like she and Lorna and trying to figure out what it was that these two very different girls actually had in common something deeper linked them deeper than both liking George and, um, and realizing that it was something about her, if mom's history and Lorna's yeah. present that linked them, mm-hmm. you know, I realized that the shoes were the linker and I didn't understand that until if sold the shoes. And then, and then when we see Lorna for the first time, when if meets Lorna for the first time, she's wearing them. And I was like, Oh, she bought the shoes. Okay, now I get it. 
So, so I, that's, it's like for me when I'm writing, it's just that it's discovery. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think somewhere I know, but I don't know consciously. And then it's just having to figure out what I'm trying to tell myself, the story I'm trying to tell myself, I guess. So yes, closing shoes, big for me. I'm glad that you noticed, actually. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. We were like, well, maybe we're thinking too. Yeah, we, well, that scene, right, with Lorna and um, <laughs> if, right? Because that, that, I guess, I was like, oh, because it could have, I think when you think of these things, right, especially with like, I don't know, I'm a big shoe person. Sometimes like if shoes go missing and you find them on some other, you, you have this like, what the, you know, like yeah. moment. Yeah. And you know, and so I, I did not expect that scene to be what it was, but it was very beautiful because of that exchange yeah. between like two individuals clothing. So. Yeah, I know it was, those scenes were awfully weird. Every time I thought I knew it was gonna happen with Lorna, something else happened. And yeah single time and there there's a character in the fairy tale um little brother and little sister there's you know the the little brother and little sister are the stepchildren of the mean stepmother but she has a daughter i guess from her first marriage that you don't see until the end of the story where she comes in and the mother uses her as a stand-in for the, the little sister who is now married to a king and the thing about the about the sister the the stepsister is that she has one of her eyes or is missing and so um she can look the her mother can can charm her to look like the little sister but only if she's only one side of her she has to lie with her face away so she can fool the king and i thought what is it about you know that wound and i thought well you know little brother and little sister got away from this abusive person but this girl never got away she had yeah. to stay and i thought about and so once i once i understood that about lorna i mm -hmm. i I things things got better, but she was really difficult um, yeah. <laughs> to wrangle in a scene. Wow, I like Lorna. Lorna's character, I think, was okay. one showed up at such an incredible time for If, and I think she developed If's character as a very like mature, empathetic person. In like, un but also like the struggle she was having of wanting to like let this like Ugh, I'm gonna be mean into like actually that. I know better because even though I feel this, it's not going to be. So it was like a very, I think we've all felt that, right? When we're like yes. in the moment. So yeah, um, I want to hate that girl. Right. And then, oh. <laughs> and then you're like, oh man, never mind. I, I, I was just, let's wrangle it back. So yeah. <laughs> I, it was like a, you know, even as an adult, right? And almost 30, you have moments like that. And I think yes. it's important for everyone of all ages to realize that it's it's okay to feel but it's sometimes it like but like and analyze it right and realize that these are very mean things right and so how not to let that play out right and so if's character did that in and a very don't let it play out like maybe you're having a strong reaction to this person you know and maybe that reaction is something you can like lean into and learn from which is what yeah. surprised me about all those girls i really wasn't sure like i i wasn't planning to have lorna bust in when george and if we're having their nice evening together <laughs> no go away but then she came and then i was like now what are we going to do with her yeah. um, so that was that was weird writing that part was a story <laughs> I felt the same way where I was like, what, what are you doing? I know. Here? I would, but it, didn't it work like at the end? Cause it made George heal. I think it, yes, it, yes, it yes. allowed, uh, I think a lot of questions to happen. So yeah, by the end of it, I was like, okay, this is, I'm so glad yes. she's grown up. That section yeah. was my favorite part because I think yeah. it, it relates to like a lot of, a lot of things you find yourself in. Yeah. yeah. So. And I also think too, that like someone who was raised as such as a feminist, as intensely as it was, might make a different choice in that in that environment knowing that she wasn't taught to be in competition with other women yes. yeah. yeah she was taught to to empathize with them and connect with them yeah and understand their their point of view and their experience right their background their own generational trauma and what has made them yes. yeah 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 um i before i ask the question it's my turn yes it's my um, yeah. ask the other question because we're almost um please yeah. uh those viewing ask your questions in the chat or comment box we have one so um please keep bringing them in and then i'll go ahead and ask the other question um where am i oh so the novel takes place in the 90s why did yeah. you decide to write about this decade and include certain musical details about the era well um I was trying to, it was the part about trying to figure out how to write about Portland. And I knew I wanted to write about Portland then. There, I feel like both of my uh, my first 
book and this book are kind of in conversation with each other. They're set in roughly the same time period. And um, I, I wanted to look at, I just wanted to look at what Portland was like when I came here and how much it's changed. And I wanted to sort of relive that time. And also I just, um, so as I started to look at like what was happening here at that time, you know, then like Riot Girl was so amazing. And when you look at like um, body positivity, that came a lot out of Riot Girl. You know, that was one of the sources for Riot, you know, for body positivity movements. There were zines talking about, you know, um, loving your body and stopping hating it. Um, there, you know, there, that whole thing, there were, you know, songs and bands. So I thought that also, I thought that if the kids were living there at that time, they would also, at least if at least, would be into zine culture and into the music and into Riot Girl. Um, so, yeah, I think that time just felt like the right time to explore mm -hmm. this story. And also, sometimes it feels like the nostalgic, re like, recent-ish past, although I guess it's considered historical fiction now. <laughs> Ah, but um, I, I think it. I think it's a nice space for magical realism. And I have to say, I really like writing pre-cell phone stories. Mm. They're very difficult to incorporate. I'd like to challenge myself to incorporate them soon. But I just like a story where you have to go places more to figure stuff out, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there are scenes in the book, right, that wouldn't have flowed as well if there was cell right, yeah. phones. Just tell them, yeah. just look it up on your cell. Google it. I know. Just right, just, it. just find out. <laughs> I mean, yes, all oh, the good old times. Of Back in those days, we had to call the library about stuff uh, because yeah. the library had a computer and the librarians knew stuff. So yeah, we used to call sometimes. Like one time, we couldn't figure out what the what the basket that goes on the back of an elephant was that people ride in was called. <laughs> but we knew there was a name for it, and we actually called the library because my kids really want to know. And the librarians were just like, duh, 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 duh. We're like, we'll call you back. And they called us back in like twenty minutes. So they were like, that's called a howda. And I was like, what? why? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You thought well, just, so. just so you know, we still know things. We can still do that. And we still get those questions asked. So. Yeah, we have a text messaging service if you want it, but you can always just call us. I'll chat and, us. And we look it up. Yeah. So it's even easier to ask you all of our yeah. questions. Yeah. Yes. We have it. a whole department who, uh, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Really? A whole department for questions? Yeah. That they, um, yeah. Info now. They just add oh, people wow. call them and yeah. then they, yeah. It, 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 it's a really cool department. I've been in it, and I mean, I give them all props. As someone who fears telephones, don't say that because I mean, I'm telling the world now. Yes. I give them all the props. Yes. It's the millennial in me. Like, I never it want is, to call to no, order. It's pizza. generational. My kids <laughs> like do anything rather than call anyone. Right. Yes. I'm like, thank God for apps because I could, or right. I would be just no yeah. pizza for me ever. <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. imagine, like, I can totally picture if walking around Portland trying to find the payphone. And I'm just like, oh my God, a payphone. Right? A payphone, right. Like and having the change phone. for a payphone. <laughs> yeah, and to call your parents, like if you're, you, like to call your parents, like like if you were going to go out on a date with someone, say, like, or your friends, you would you would call on the phone and you'd say, you'd plan it and you'd be like, I'm going to meet you here at X time. You would have a watch if you were, you know, organized or like me, you'd be like asking everybody what time it was that you saw the tree. And then you like have to meet them there at that time. And if you are late, they don't know what happened to you. They don't know, should we wait? Should we not wait? Like, there's no way to even tell them what happened. Well, and even just memorizing those phone numbers, right? That's what I was going to say. I was like, like, yeah. I don't know how to call. Like, I'm a yes. grown person that does not know, like, the house phone like, number. Your home yes. number? Oh, yeah. I, I still remember my home number, though. And my mom's. You know, yeah. anyway. so those are the ones. Those are the ones. Those are the important ones. Right? You know? Yeah. I mean, your mom's or your home. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, I, we, we have audience questions, Delia. Yeah, I'll go to, so our first audience <laughs> question is from Diane. And um, she is asking, has, uh, will you, have you been doing any virtual school visits? And have there been any fun questions from the teens about your writing? Ah, um, I have not done school visits yet because the book just came out in July. Um, so hopefully I will be doing some during the school year. I can now with Zoom, it's like so easy to, you know, do a school visit virtually, which is really nice. Um, however, I did just teach um, a class through this really amazing nonprofit in Seattle called Young Women Empowered, Why We. And um, I spent eight days with a group of amazing teen writers 
uh, talking about speculative fiction and BIPOC futurisms, and they had um, they had incredible questions, and just their writing was amazing, and um, I feel very hopeful about the future after spending eight days with those young women. So, um, yeah, mostly the mostly questions that they asked were about. Um, publishing. They were really, they really didn't know how the publishing industry worked. And I really related to that because, you know, I came to writing very late and had no idea how that worked at all. And I had never met a published writer. So to like actually see the books, you know, in their hands and be like, whoa, like, how does this happen? It is a mysterious process. So I, I enjoyed demystifying um, that process for them. And I think that's exciting, right? To hear like teens and youth want to learn that process yeah, and yeah. being curious, I think is very inspiring to me because I'm really excited to read what our youth has to say about what they're experiencing in the world, right? And how they, they see and um, navigate this world. Cause I think, you know, as we get older, we tend to forget or, you know, we're just, yeah. we got to accept that we are not young anymore. Yeah. And so, <laughs> no. Like it's hard to have a dream if you can't figure out, like if you can't visualize the roadmap Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of talking about like futurism, like what Toni Morrison said about if there is a book that you want to see in the world that doesn't exist, you have to write that book. And then, but it, I think it helps to also know like, okay, I'm going to write that book and then I'm going to like give it to like five of my smartest friends and they're going to critique it and we're going to make it really good. And then we're going to like go on the internet and we're going to figure out which agents to query and we're going to query those agents. <laughs> you know, like to know, I guess to not have it be, because I thought authors were so remote and mysterious. And I yeah. had just known a person who was an author, like just a regular human. Mm -hmm. I think it would have um, maybe helped me to think that I could do that sooner. Yeah, it is very true. I think the more writers I get to know and hear and talk to personally, the more I'm like, wow, this is actually something that's like available, right? It's not yeah. this like dream yeah. that you can never be. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Absolutely. All right. Uh, okay. So we have another audience question from Eddie Vera, and it says, "For others that want to get into this type of genre, fantasy, magical realism, what are, what other literary works or authors would you recommend?" Okay, a favorite subject of mine. Um, it, for our older teen readers and adults, I would definitely say Toni Morrison is a good is a great place to start. Um, also, um, Isabella Allende, just sort of almost anything she's written. Um, Evaluna was one of the first things, and House of Spirits were two of the first books that I read in Magical Realism that I loved. Um, I also um, loved uh, uh, Laura Esquivel, like Water for Chocolate. I think that's great for teens and adults. It's hilarious and so good. Um, last night I was in conversation with Samantha Mabry, who is a Latinx author from Texas, whose uh, last book was called Tigers Not Daughters, and it was intense and amazing. And she writes very, very good books. She has um, two other books as well, All the Wind in the World and, um, oh gosh, A Fierce and Subtle Poison. Those are all great places to start with magic realism. I actually read House of Spirits in high school and it made me like connect to my grandmother in a whole different realm because of magical realism. So yes, yes, yes. Please read that. All right. So um, that concludes our question Q&A part of the program because we're almost coming in and we don't want to hold you for yeah. forever. I mean, we can keep you. Me and Celia will chat. We'll chat your <laughs> yeah, ear we still have like a hundred more questions. I know. You know just, <laughs> I've been doing um, it. So there's that five minutes. <laughs> All right. So, and now we're going to play this game that we like to call this or that or um, rapid fire questions. And okay. so this is just for fun and it allows us to learn a little more, more a little more about you. Okay. So I'll ask you really quickly um, a statement when well, me and Celia will ask you, and then you'll tell us what you prefer okay. or your response. Okay. Okay. Yes, we're gonna start. San Francisco or Portland? San Francisco. Uh, breakfast or lunch? Sorry, over. Breakfast, always breakfast. <gasps> lunch, lunch, really late breakfast. Late, late. <laughs> Acting or directing? Ooh, directing. Uh, Star Trek or Star Wars? Oh, Star Trek. Nirvana or Bikini Kill? Bikini Kill. Cheerios or cornflakes? Ooh, cornflakes. It's close. <laughs> if or or. Oh God. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I feel like he told us this already. I know. <laughs> that's Sophie's Choice, though, but now I love them both so equally. No, no, it's, that's like Sophie's Choice. I can't do it. <laughs> um, okay, we'll let you skip this one. Um, walk or drive? Uh, walk. Suburb or city? City. New shoes or no clothing? New shoes. 
Would you rather be able to eat anything you wanted or be able to predict the future? Predict the future. Would you rather walk on the moon or be able to walk barefoot anywhere? Um, walk on the moon. Would you rather never be able to drink coffee or never be able to drink water? Never be able to drink water. <laughs> oh, same, 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 same. Well, that's, that's true, though. That's uh, true. That is I true. know. <laughs> okay, would you rather spend every day eating the same thing or spend every day listening to the same song? Wow. Oh, my God. I think it's going to have to be the same thing. Food, yeah. Ooh, that's a hard. Poor one. ears. I'm all right. And truth or dare? Oh, <laughs> truth. I always do truth. Me too. Always truth. Yeah. Is it dare. true that me and Patty are your favorite librarians? Um. Yeah. <laughs> She's all like, true. I'm thinking, which of, do I know? Are any of the other librarians that I know going to be listening right, right. now? Your favorite, like, okay, okay, all right. Let me rephrase the question. Is it true that Patty and I are your favorite librarians today that you've met? Yes, that is a yeah. thousand percent true. Absolutely. And I have to say that, um, you know, librarians ask the best questions. Any book event that has librarians asking you questions, you know it's going to be like fun and smart and good and that they're going to have their act together, that they'll have read your book and that the questions are going to be just like so interesting. I'm just like always excited to talk to librarians. And I have to say, my favorite place to do book events is the LA Public Library. My last event I did with you guys was wonderful too. So I love you guys. You guys are the best. I hope we can have you in person one day. I know, you can see, I know. You can see all the little tabbies in my book. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I just want to. I just want to visit. I have family in LA too that I like to come to. So yes. maybe we'll make it happen one of these days. Yes, of course. Um, so that's it for for our questions for you. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us today. Like I said, Kenny and I have a thousand more questions, but we'll we'll have to bug you next time you come. Yeah. Just you know. Also, you guys, could, like, if anyone has questions, anyone. I, I really reply to people on Instagram and, and Twitter. So, you know, if you want to contact me, um, there's also a question form on my on my uh, website, but I'd love to hear from readers and I'm happy to answer writing questions as well. So thank awesome. you so much, Michelle. Thank you. thank you all for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with author Michelle Ruiz Kyle. Uh, remember to visit LAPL.org to read more books by Michelle or any of the authors that she mentioned today. Uh, we hope that we hope that you will mark your calendars to join us virtually on Saturday, September 26th for the Los Angeles Libros Festival. This is a free bilingual book festival and it is for the whole family and is a collaboration between Los Angeles Public Library, La Libreria and Reforma, which is the natural, national association to promote library and information services to Latinos and the Spanish speaking. To learn more about the festival, you can visit this really awesome URL that is coming up on your screen and also in the comments. Um, so visit for more festival information. And remember that our next year author program will be with me and Patty again next Friday, August 20th at 4 p.m. We will be reading, um, you'll join us as we chat with author Carla Valenti as she presents her upcoming book, Loteria. With Pat, which Patty is holding. Um, so thank you all so much for attending our virtual year author program. We can't wait to see you all next week. And again, on September 26th for the LA Libros Festival. Adios. Thank you.